the Bible, New Testament, Paul's writing, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 16. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Give thanks. God bless you. You may be seated. As has already been mentioned, we are just a few hours away from being a week away from celebrating the Thanksgiving holiday. And then that leads us into that most wonderful time of the year, one of my favorite times of the year as we march towards Christmas. And um, it's, it's sad to have to say this, but uh, no indictment on, on my home or anything, but Racetrack was the first place I got to hear Christmas music this season. And as I was pumping my gas, it kind of sounded good. And uh, just made things feel a little better for a moment. But it is uh, that time of the year, and hopefully, and no doubt many of us are gonna be able to pause from work and school and gather with friends and family and enjoy a day of fun and food and fellowship and I know that Brother uh, John Turner's already mentioned it, but I just want to highlight that as a, the family of God and the local congregation, we do want to be aware of those among us who maybe are alone or new to our church or new to our city and invite them to come and be with you and share in your family's activities because it's going to be a celebration. Three people believe that. And uh, one of the reasons why is that there is more food consumed on Thanksgiving than any other day of the year. Surveys vary, of course, but according to Statistica, 83% of Thanksgiving meals are going to have turkey. 77% of you will enjoy stuffing. 65% will have sweet potato or yams. And in fact, the USDA says to make that happen, 46 million Turkeys will be eaten on Thanksgiving. 40% of Campbell's cream of mushroom soup sales are going to happen next week. The vast majority of that is for that infamous Aunt Somebody's green bean casserole. 80 million pounds of cranberries will be purchased next week. And to top it off, Americans will then choose from their three favorite pies per Instacart, which are pumpkin, apple, and pecan, and how can you go wrong with any of those? But that all accumulates in the typical American consuming 3,150 calories and 159 grams of fat at the Thanksgiving meal, and you cannot walk that off. <laughs> and if you add seconds and large portions and high-fat desserts, that calorie count will climb on average to 4,500 calories, which is the equivalent, ladies and gentlemen, of eight Big Macs at one time. And so if you were not hungry before you came to church, you are now hungry, and I'm the only thing between you and McDonald's. And yet, all of that aside, and as true as that may be, and hopefully it's all of that for you and yours, as followers of Jesus Christ, giving thanks is more than a holiday. It's more than even a periodic season of reflection. Grateful is who we are, and giving thanks is what we do, 24-7, 365. The psalmist declared in Psalms 92, it is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. Giving thanks is our acknowledgement of the sovereign greatness of of God. Giving thanks is us acknowledging that we are dependent and the beneficiary of his goodness and his faithfulness and his forgiveness. 
The psalmist would say in Psalms 107, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Like love, gratitude cannot be silent. I'm thankful inside. And gratitude cannot be bound or steal. It must be expressed. And so let the redeemed of the Lord say so. As David wrote in Psalms 100, thanksgiving is the first step in the biblical order of worship. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful and bless his name for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures for all generations. So I'll say it again, a thankful heart cannot be contained because thanksgiving bursts from the grateful soul like a geyser explodes from beneath the ground. You cannot just hold it back. Like the old song declares, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he has done for me. My soul cries out, hallelujah, thank God for saving me. I don't know about you this evening, but I cannot help but say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the air that I breathe. Thank you, Lord, for waking me up this morning. I didn't earn it. I didn't deserve it. I, I'm not all that. It's his air and it's his hand that wakens me up. And that's just getting started because you don't know like I know what he's done for me. He, he loved me when I was unlovable. He gave me a space of grace to repent. He forgave me of my sins and he filled me with his Holy Spirit. I am fully known by God, yet I am fully loved by God. Thank you, Lord. His peace rules preeminent in his mind and his joy fills my heart. I have food to eat. I have a home to live in. I have clothes to wear and shoes on my feet. So pardon me if I defy the ingratitude of our present culture and say, thank you, Lord. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your mercy. If it had not been for the Lord, where would I be? I refuse to be a prisoner of ingratitude. I don't deserve anything. I'm not privileged. I don't have a right to anything. I just choose to be thankful to lift my voice in humble adoration and say, thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. And yet, as true as all of that is, and it should be for each of us, but that's not even all. Vibrant praise and worship is not the only ways we get to say thank you to the Lord. Right. See, it is gratefulness that motivates us to offer ourselves in service to the king and his kingdom, to commit our time and to commit our skills to advancing his mission within the context of the local church and even our communities. It's an attitude of gratitude that acknowledges the reality that God is the owner of everything, and that means I am the manager, only the manager of what he grants unto me and invests in me which means I am accountable to God for my time and my, my talent and my treasure. And so it, it, that, that is why it is with joy. It is with thanksgiving. It is with gratitude that you and I, we return our tithes to the Lord. Not out of obligation. It is with gratitude and thanksgiving that, that I live within a budget so that I can systematically give to world missions and give to the imagined vision. I do that not because I feel guilty. I do it because I'm thankful to God and I believe in his word and I'm convinced that his way is right. 
It is thanksgiving that, that allows me to hear his voice and obey his call to sacrificial commitment, even when it hurts, trusting that he will provide all that I need. You see, I take to heart the story that Jesus told in Luke 12 about a rich farmer who enjoyed yet another lucrative year of harvest, but instead of acknowledging the goodness of God, instead of investing his blessings into the things God values, this farmer ignored God. He rejected the lordship of God, and he selfishly chose to hoard his blessing. And Jesus says in Luke 12 and 18 that this rich man said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And I will store up all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, because I'm the king of my own soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Jesus was not impressed, to say the least, but Jesus called this ungrateful farmer a fool. And that night, the fool called a farmer entered eternity with an empty hand and an empty soul. In fact, when we look throughout the Bible, being unthankful is consistently associated with people who reject God and are ungodly, and are evil, and of a debased mind. That's what ingratitude is associated with. Example, listen to how Paul described those who reject God in Romans 1 and 21. Paul says, although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, but became futile in their thought, or excuse me, nor were what? nor were thankful and became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were, and God turned them over to the vile deeds that Paul catalogs in Romans chapter one. So when you and I slip into an attitude of ingratitude, we are aligning with things we do not want to align with. I don't want to be a fool who ungratefully and selfishly hoards my worship and my service and my giving, but instead I want to choose to bow down before the Lord my King. I want to bow with a reverent gratitude for who he is and what he has done for my life. Because, ladies and gentlemen, gratitude, it is an attitude. And that means it is a choice and it is the will of God for you and I. Luke shares another intriguing story in Luke 17. Jesus is making his way to Jerusalem. He's gonna be betrayed, arrested, rejected, and ultimately crucified. And he's traveling somewhere between, along the border of Samaria and Galilee. And Luke 17 and 12 says, he entered into a certain village and there met him 10 men who were lepers, and they stood afar off. You see, leprosy was terrifying. It was an incurable disease, but the debilitating physical pain and suffering was only part of the story because leprosy was also a, also a debilitating social stigma. Lepers were marginalized. Lepers were outcasts. They lived under a supposed divine curse, Lepers suffered the humiliation of being expected to cry out, unclean, unclean, when anybody came near them. They were not living an enviable life. It was full of pain and loss and suffering and shame. And yet somehow these 10 lepers knew who Jesus was. They recognized him as the Lord. Maybe they had heard the stories that circulated throughout the region. Maybe they'd even heard about the leper in Luke 5 that Jesus had touched and immediately the leprosy had been cleansed. Whatever the case was, what we do know is that they knew enough to cry out for help. In verse 13, the Bible says they 
lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Jesus, when he saw them and he heard them, he didn't touch them. He didn't command leprosy out of their body. He didn't speak healing over them. Instead, he commanded them to go to the priest and present themselves. And, and that was unique because that was the legal prescription for being restored after you had been healed. But we know the story, if we know our Bibles a little bit, that by faith, these 10 lepers said, I don't know, beat standing here. And by faith, they obeyed what Jesus told them to do. And as they went, the Bible says they were healed of the dreaded disease. And that is an amazing story. But that's not the end of the story. Because the Bible says in verse 15 that one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he returned and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. When this leper saw that he was healed, how I don't know how he knew. Did a finger grow back? Did a scab cover up? Did pain disappear? We don't know, but somehow when he saw that he was healed, he recognized something more than a healing has taken place. This leper understood that through Jesus Christ, he had spiritual access to God, and that was something that had never happened to this man before. You see, this leper was a Samaritan. He had been physically alienated by a disease but he had been spiritually alienated by his race and birth. And yet of all of the 10 lepers, it was this Samaritan leper who stopped in his tracks and spun around and came running to Jesus. And with the same loud voice that he had cried for mercy, he began to praise God and he fell on his face before the Lord and he acknowledged him as his Lord and his God and he gave thanks. And Jesus answered and said, we're not 10 cleansed. Where are the nine? And that's a sermon on its own right there. Where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And to call, and when Jesus said foreigner, he was not being kind. Essentially, it was a street term about the equivalent of Jesus calling the Syrophoenician woman a dog. And Jesus is like, of the 10 lepers, where are the nine? And the, the only guy who gets it is a Samaritan. Where, where, where were the nine? Were they only obe obedient enough to get their miracle, but they really had no interest in following Jesus? They just checked just enough boxes to get what they wanted, but they had no interest in him being God? Were they only willing to acknowledge him as healer and peace giver and way maker, but they were not willing to, to acknowledge him as Lord? We, we don't know. What we do know is what happened to the Samaritan leper who returned with humble thanksgiving because verse 19 says that Jesus said to him, arise, Go your way, your faith has made you well or whole or literally your faith has saved you. Ten lepers received their healing, but only that grateful Samaritan leper was reconciled to God 
and made physically and spiritually whole on that day when he came and gave thanks. You know what? Can I remind you this evening that just like that Samaritan leper, you and I were hopelessly alienated from God. I know when you got up this morning and put on your clothes and looked in the mirror, you said, man, I am one great human being and God is so delighted to have me in his kingdom. But for the rest of us, we were hopelessly alienated from God. And at the cross, Jesus offered himself as the perfect and the final sacrifice for the remission of our sins. It was Jesus who became our high priest. That Samaritan had no priest. That Samaritan had no way to God. But Jesus became his priest and his way to God. And Jesus became our priest. And as Paul would tell Timothy, there is one God and one mediator between God, the man Christ Jesus. As the writer of Hebrews would say in Hebrews 4 and 15, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Here's what gets to happen. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, brothers and sisters, you and I can come near to God through Jesus Christ. As Paul would write to the Ephesians in chapter 2, verse 12, in those days you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel. You did not know the covenant promises that God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. But now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. But when we come near to God, we must emulate that Samaritan leper and we must come with heartfelt praise and we must come in submission to his lordship and we must come with thanksgiving. So no wonder that as Paul closed out his second letter to the Thessalonians that Paul would say, rejoice always, pray without ceasing in everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. You don't even have to pray about it. You don't have to go on a three-day fast. You don't have to go on a 21-day Daniel's fast. You, you don't have to join a prayer chain. You don't have to lay and throw dust and ashes on your head. You don't have to read all the Bible. You can read one verse and know God's will for your life. Three verses will give you God's will. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks. In everything, give thanks. In the good times and in the bad times, give thanks. In health and in sickness, give thanks. In abundance and in scarcity, give thanks. In everything, give thanks. Because God can and God will accomplish his perfect plan in our lives, whether it's a good day or it's a bad day. And quite often, it is the low points in our life that God uses to launch us into the high points of our life. So on the good and the bad and in everything, give thanks. Paul said to the Romans, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. That's not difficult to believe and live out when the sun is shining. When everybody's healthy in your family, it's a great day. When you just received a raise, thank you, Jesus, let's go. When the baby sleeps through the night, hallelujah, thank you, God. 
When your spouse thinks you walk on water, write it in your journal and celebrate. Blessed be the name of the Lord. When you're feasting on 4,500 calories, thank you, Jesus. But what about when the storms of life come rolling in and the darkness of uncertainty swirls around you when sickness strikes, when sacrificial giving hits home and causes loss, when there's the pink slip that's handed out on the job, when there are marital challenges, when you're laying comatose on the couch after consuming those 4,500 calories with heartburn raging through your soul, what then do you do? In everything, give thanks. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Repentance of gluttony might be in that line. And in everything, give thanks. Things. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you because gratitude is an attitude, which means it's a choice and it is the will of God. Need more convincing this evening? Not enough amens. Paul wrote to the Ephesians in 5 and 20, giving thanks always for all things. Giving thanks always for all things to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. To the Philippians, he would write, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. To the Colossians, Paul would say, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Give thanks. In everything, give thanks. It is the will of God. In other words, all of our life is worship. All of life is worship. And so our praise and our service and our giving offered to God as worship must always be punctuated by an attitude of gratitude. It is the will of God. And who knows? Who knows what miracle? Who knows what healing? Who knows what provision? Who knows what deliverance? Who knows what restoration? Who knows what reconciliation? Who knows what wholeness is just one grateful prayer away. What we know is, as the psalmist said, it is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High. If you're able, let's stand. When he saw God's work in his life, he slammed on the brakes, he spun around, and he came running to Jesus. And he came with a praise on his lips. He came with submission to the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ in his life. And he came with a grateful heart. And when you approach God in submission with a grateful heart, anything is possible.
And who knows what miracle, what long prayer, what breakthrough. It's just one simple prayer of thanksgiving away that acknowledges who God is and acknowledges what God has done. And whether you're in the mire of the deepest valley of your life or you're floating on the clouds of victory, that you could come before a mighty God and fall on your face and say, blessed be the name of the Lord. I thank you, God. I give you thanks. I give you thanks. Lord, I give you thanks. I don't have the answers. I don't know the end from the beginning. I don't know when the miracle's gonna come. I don't know how you're gonna work it out, God. I don't know how you're gonna supply the need. I don't know where the God factor's coming from. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, but blessed be the name of the Lord. I thank you, Lord, you know. I thank you, Lord, you're the author and the finisher of my faith. I thank you, Lord, that I am never alone. I thank you, Lord, that you will direct my path and you will order my steps. I thank you, Lord God, that your angels encamp around me, Lord God, and your name is a strong tower and I can run into it and be saved. I thank you, Lord, that I was young and now I'm old, but I have never seen the righteous forsaken. I thank you, Lord God, that you are a peace that is preeminent and it passes all understanding. I thank you, Lord, for a joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. I thank you, Lord, that I can take comfort that in a moment and in a twinkling of an eye, you're gonna come back for me, Lord God. I thank you, Lord, that you have prepared a place for me, a, a place called heaven. I thank you, Lord. I worship you. I exalt you. In everything, give thanks. In everything, give thanks. Oh, it's early this evening. So many of you have already come up. I would invite us all. Why don't we just take time? And in your own words, why don't you just say, thank you, Lord. I can't say it like you can say it. I don't know the resume you're grateful for. I don't have your testimony, but you do. Why don't you speak it out in gratitude to God? I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Jesus. I will give you thanks, Lord. I will give you thanks, oh God. I will be grateful, Lord. I will bless you and exalt you, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's lift up our voice. Hey, let's just take time. We're not in a hurry. Why don't you just take time to just walk through the list of things you're grateful for? Hallelujah.